Diego Maradona spent seven of the last ten years of his life living in Dubai. In many ways, those years were an anomaly set against the rest of his life. He was born in a downhill suburb of Buenos Aires. As a small child, he would scavenge for silver foil from cigarette boxes to sell for pennies. Then from around the age of 15, he was thrust into a life in the limelight as a football prodigy, and all the while trouble followed him. From the frenzy and colour of Boca, Barcelona, Naples, UAE was a complete contrast. He had a peaceful life, in a villa with views of the Arabian Gulf, and the tranquillity, rare as it was for him, had a big effect. Early in his time in the city, he said, this is paradise, and his affinity with the place only ever grew stronger. Welcome to the fifth and final episode of Diego Maradona, the Dubai Years. I'm Paul Radley, sports writer for The National, and I'm here with John McCauley, the football writer. In this episode, we'll attempt to get under the skin of Maradona and find out what made him who he was and understand why UAE, which is where he served two stints as a manager, was so close to his heart. Yeah, so everybody we spoke to said that Maradona had this aura, that he was completely unique, different to anyone else that they'd ever come across. And, and one of those people that we did speak to was Jihad Muntasser, a former footballer and a long-time Dubai resident, who had actually watched Maradona in Italy whenever he was a youth player at Atalanta in the late 1980s, around that time that it was Maradona's crowning club moment with Napoli, obviously. Jihad and Maradona then became close friends in Dubai, and that was made possible because they conversed in Italian, sharing jokes that no one else would understand. They later went on to work together on a, a football program that was the brainchild of Jihad. It was an X Factor style football show that had Maradona as a judge in its first season. Just to give you an idea of the sort of people that Maradona was competing with as judges, you had some of the greatest and most well known football names at the time. Just to give you an example, you had Brazil's Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, and Luis Figo were just a few that were part of the program. I never met someone like Diego. Diego had a different charisma about him. Um, uh, he really seemed like a, a genius uh, in, in a crazy way, you know. And I think uh, no one was like him and everyone else knew that. Even Ronaldo, the Brazilian himself, they, they all knew that Maradona was on a different level. The problem is Diego had you know, had his problems, his, his lifestyle, his, uh, and that affected his relationship with people in a, in a negative way. But still, uh, even, even though he embarrassed himself many times, like in the World Cup in front of the whole world, still people continued to love him because of, of who he was, you know, his, his prison. He could get away with anything, basically. He could get away with murder. <laughs> Okay, so that was Jihad Mantassa, another person we spoke to who probably really well reflected and personified the magnetism of Maradona was Stefano Cecchi. Yeah, so Stefano, pretty colourful guy. He grew up as a Napoli fanatic. He lived about an hour outside Naples and he went there to watch Napoli every week during the, the mid to late 80s when obviously Maradona was, was an absolute hero there at the club. Stefano would take the train every match day to watch them where he'd sneak into the San Paolo Stadium early in the morning and then hide in the rafters until kickoff. Just to highlight Stefano's preoccupation with Maradona, he actually travelled to Cuba whenever Maradona was in rehab there. He travelled over there three times from Italy in six weeks. And this is, it's worth saying, this is before Maradona even knew who he was. And from there, incredibly, just through sheer perseverance, he became part of Maradona's inner circle. And he ended up being at Maradona's side for the best part of two and a half decades. If you ask me what Diego means for me, Diego was my life. I'm 47 years old and half of my life I lived with Diego. Since I was a baby, my dream was to come to Maradona. If I would go to the carnival, I would dress as Maradona. If I was playing football, I would wear the t-shirt with Maradona and the number 10. And then, after I was a little bit older, I was lucky enough and so grateful to God that I met Diego and that he accepted me in his life 
and gave a lot to Diego. I gave him my blood. People called me when Diego died because they knew how close we were and the very strong relationship I had with him. Because I was not just a simple friend, I loved Diego. My wife and his wife know it, that I loved him. So at night, when I put Diego on the bed, I used to kiss him. It was like kissing my daughter. When I used to go out, I would buy a toy for my daughters and something for Diego. So this is what I was telling you. My dog is Diego, my daughter is Maradona, because I have to keep something in my house of Diego. Diego, I will never cancel him from my head or from my heart. Yeah, so dog named Diego, daughter literally named Maradona, and he actually, I laughed when he said that, and he actually showed me a picture of, of his daughter's passport. So like his other major life decisions, Maradona is the reason Stefano lives in, in Dubai today. At first he would visit Maradona here, so he would come for every single birthday, and any other kind of big occasion in, in Maradona's life, before he ended up living at Maradona's villa with him for, for some time. Until he realized that Maradona was so enamored with Dubai that he should move here too. Diego, Dubai fue una etapa de su vida muy importante. For Diego, Dubai was a really important stage in his life. He always said that this was the best place he could have been because of the Arab culture, the traditions, the religion and everything. But Diego always said he was more respected here than he was in his home country because here he found peace, tranquility and respect. Even the last time somebody asked him the best place to go on holiday, and he said Dubai. If Diego had stayed in Dubai, he would still be alive, for sure. Some really heartfelt stuff there from uh, Stefano on what Dubai meant to Maradona, and, and I think we can't argue that the the lifestyle it afforded to him was about as normal a, an, an existence as as he had anywhere really. And somebody in in the position that he was, and how much of a celebrity he was, could could really have another person who echoed that thought was uh, Ria Chowdhury, who was a key aide of Maradona um, when he was in Dubai and, and became a, a very close friend. And he actually said that. The best Diego was the, was the one that we had in Dubai. What, what else did uh, Riyad have to, to say? He picked out specifically 2013. He said whenever Maradona was training like crazy in a, his, his private gym at his villa, uh, he said he was he was eating really, really healthily. He said he, at one stage Maradona said, Riyad, Riyad, I'm, I'm only eating chicken and fish. I'm flying like a bird and, and swimming like a fish. So, you know, he really felt contented. And and one of the major reasons why he was so happy here was was the kind of relative freedom that he enjoyed here and, and one of the byproducts of that was that he would play tennis unimpeded almost every day and, and Riyad became not only a close friend as you said but he became Maradona's tennis partner but he did tell us that their friendship ended once they got onto the court. After years we went uh, we started to play tennis together just uh, let's go let's so going to my car and we, we, we take the rackets um, I took him first time to the Jabal Ali golf course. It's where it's very quiet. They have a nice surrounding. You have, you have nice uh, as well. You have the nature is really. You have uh, some foxes, some nice birds there, and even no one, no one did recognize him because we met barely almost no one. The, the tennis court was booked. Just I got here. We went to the court. We played. And then, and then we left, uh, so it was totally incognito, but it was really a private moment, so we, we did uh, enjoy it so much, so much. And then after that we had many others, uh, other um, tennis matches together, really matches, I can say matches, <laughs> because Diego is very competitive at any level, personal or whatever, if it's, if it's a World Cup game, football game, 
or private tennis game with with no one, with a with a simple friend, and he's and he does magic with whatever it is, it is like a ball, with a tennis ball he did magic. He was joining at the beginning with the ball because yeah, whatever it's spheric, uh, as a sphere, he starts to jungle with it. it. It's amazing. But touching the ball, with the racket during the game, so he couldn't run because he had had knee uh, had knee uh, problems, but. To compensate his his magic touch with the racket, so he puts the ball where he wants and where you you less expect it. <laughs> it was amazing. It was really a pleasure. So Riyad's relationship developed to such an extent that he would call into Maradona's unannounced to watch a Champions League match. You know, he would just pull up a seat beside him if there was one free, and they'd sit and enjoy enjoy the football or he would pop in for a coffee where he was telling us that they would sit together and, and talk and Diego would hold court and they'd dip their cake into their drinks or he would spend the evening at Maradona's villa on invitation where he would enjoy a barbecue and that was one of Maradona's favourite pastimes. That's not to say Maradona was always a joy to be around. He could be grumpy and moody and irritable and rude. Uh, Riyad came out with a brilliant line saying that he can be the big heart of the universe or he can be hell as well. We heard from Jihad earlier on um, and I think as, as you were saying, John, uh, he, he experienced a lot of those, those moments with Maradona too. Yeah, so he had the, the TV programme called The Victorious that, um, as I said to you, that Maradona was, was ju- one of the, the mainstay judges from the first series and Jihad was describing how even just waking up Maradona for filming, he said you never knew what mood he was going to be in so what they would do, they came up with these little tricks to keep him entertained. So they would fly in his daughter all the way from Argentina just to keep him occupied, so to speak, or some of his close friends. Giad said like during the, the filming, he said there were times where Maradona threatened to leave mid-show. For example, they would have these games that they would play, this, this X-Factor football show that the, the contestants, the, the young footballers, aspiring footballers would play during the show. And they'd bring in a, a referee from, from outside of, of their production to, to come in and, and officiate the game and, and apparently Maradona at times would insult the referee calling his, his mother all sorts of names <laughs> <laughs> um, he would even get in the kids faces sometimes telling them quite bluntly that he, he didn't like their performance but even still Giad said that he was undoubtedly the star you know he just had this instinct this passion this emotion and this spontaneity and he said still today he gets messages from from the kids who were on that show saying that they they didn't realize or they only realize now the experience that they lived through how lucky they were that that they managed to live this part of their lives with Maradona right there front and center but Jihad said look this was still a, a very troublesome kind of working relationship and he managed to keep Maradona for the whole season and keep him committed to the project for the whole season which was 12 episodes and apparently Maradona had never done anything beyond one episode before unfortunately it, it was difficult to manage him and it, it became so difficult that even in season 2 we had to take the decision not to carry on with him because the risk of having Diego on board uh was too high, you know. It, it's rewarding when when things go go well, but uh, Diego was too unpredictable that we could not risk, you know, uh, especially financially and the commitments we had with sponsors and everything. Uh, so when we made that decision, he was really heartbroken. You know, this is I'll never forget it. You know, he, he, we we told I, I can't remember the excuse we gave to him for not being on season two. But he, that was okay with him. But the day he saw the billboard of the victorious season two, and he saw the pictures of the judges that were going to be there that season, he called me and he said, uh, I'll never forget that. He said, Gijo, because he, he used to call me Gijo. Uh, he said, uh, I'm very, very disappointed. And I said, what, Diego? I, I thought we, we talked about this. And he says, no, no, no. I'm disappointed because you brought judges of a second division category <laughs> and the judges were, were names like Thierry Henry uh, Del Piero you know the top players in the world but for him they were second category you know? to be honest it was difficult because he felt I think inside he felt uh, betrayed you know Tarek El Sharabi who was Awas was PR manager during 
Maradona's time as manager there, but also his English language translator and also he became a close confidant. Um, he knew how important building up the trust was of Maradona uh, uh, to having an amicable, lasting relationship, a working one, obviously, from their point of view. He said that he did experience many highs and lows with Maradona, obviously with the magnetism and the moods of him. Um, and he said that it was a difficult relationship to manage from that perspective. You don't want to get on his bad side. You don't want to get on Diego's bad side. Like he, he'll just, he will not forget. He will remember. And he will just, you know, he, he's, a, he's a very emotional person. Really. I mean, I realize how emotional, how sensitive he is. When he's happy, he'll, he'll joke with you and he'll be so humble and he'll be so accommodating and you'll feel like he's, a, he's, a, he's your friend. But just, you know, it, it's deceiving because once you get too comfortable and you think, you know what, uh, and you say something that ticks him off, you feel like he's, you've lost him. Yes, Tarek said it was a difficult relationship to manage, but he did feel that the bond that they had between them grew closer. Uh, over time, Maradona sort of would let down his guard and want to celebrate the victories they had at Awasal with him and share whatever moments he could. And they had one particular moment that I know it, it meant a real great deal to him for reasons that were beyond a professional relationship, but beyond beyond a personal one. It went a long way, didn't it, John? Absolutely. Even whenever Tarek's telling us this this story, he was getting quite emotional, as you'll hear. But to set the scene, he, he was telling us that people would come from all over the world to watch training and especially a lot of Argentinians he said it was it was just an event just to come and see see Maradona so in one particular night there was a group of Palestinians who had arrived and they were making loads of noise Tarek was telling us that they were cheering on Maradona during the training chanting his name and and singing and and trying to get his attention and once training had finished one of the group approached Maradona and put a Palestine scarf around his shoulders and said we'd love to host you in in Palestine and apparently Maradona really took to them and stood and, and chatted with them. One, one of them, thankfully, was from South America and could speak Spanish and they posed for pictures. And those pictures were soon online and, and apparently they went viral. Maradona was later asked about this at a, a post-match press conference at Banias, one of the other teams in, in the UAE Pro League. And it's worth saying at this time that Maradona didn't know much about Tarek away from the weekly media obligations. He didn't know his background. And Tarek's from Palestine. But he grew up in the UAE. So this is Tarek's very vivid account of that press conference at Banias. So he's now speaking in Spanish and he's saying words and I'm like, I'm getting all emotional here. I'm like, what is he saying? What is he saying? Oh my God, what is he saying? Okay, Palestina. And then he says the word Castro and then he's talking Chavez and then he's talking God knows what, Libertad. I'm like, oh my. I started to pick up some words, you know. The Arabic translator also He's a very emotional guy, by the way. He, it was so funny when, when, when Diego would try, would say, would speak, the Arabic guy would, would, would convey the same emotion. If Diego's excited, the guy would be excited. If he's angry, he's shouting, he's shouting. Um, I used to tell him, listen, you don't have to shout at the media. He's the one shouting. You don't have to. And he's like, no, I'm not. but then I started doing the same thing. I started getting emotional and during press conferences sometimes, laughing or so. It was interesting. So anyway, um, the Arabic translator also got emotional and he, and he really gave it. Like he's like, I am with the Palestinian. I am, uh, and he, and he's and so I'm listening to the Arabic guy saying, "I really, really admire the Palestinians. I I believe in their cause. It's a just cause. If anyone would understand it, it's us, the South Americans. I learned so much about the Palestinians from my time and in Venezuela, in Cuba. I was spoken to. I was I was uh, informed by Hugo Chavez, and I was informed by Fidel Castro, and they told me, and I'm like, oh my." God. The Arabic guy is saying all of this and I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like the guy really supports my people, you know? And I had no idea, really. I'm like, so why would he? You know, just, and how do I stay composed, but, you know, also really take advantage of this moment to make some, you know, some noise about it. I can't. I'm not in a position to voice my political views. All right, but now all I'm doing is translating what this legend is saying. I didn't make it up. I said everything, everything he said, but with a bit of a more an oomph, you know, and a bit of a more passion in it. And I found myself ending the press conference there in such, I don't know what to do. I want to hug him. He felt it. He felt that I was so emotional. I remember as soon as I said, thank you. He said, thank you. We stood up 
And I turned to him, he looked at me, and, and he started speaking. He, I didn't say anything. He started speaking in Spanish. I called him, I'm like, come here, what is he saying? And he's like, he's saying, listen, Tarek, I didn't know you were Palestinian up until a few, I was asking, who's, who's this, where's this guy from? He's just asking the translator, where's, who is he, where's he from? Where does he, uh, uh, he thought I was in Marathi, all right? So they told him, he's a Palestinian guy, he works for a company, huh? So he's like, I only recently found out you're Palestinian. Everything I just said was the honest truth. I answered the question in all honesty. I just wanted to you know. He, he took it on himself to explain because he saw it in my eyes that I'm trying to ex like, uh, uh, um, express my emotions, but he, th he felt that, you know, I'm going to make it easier for you guys. I'm going to tell you that it's all legit. You're, you're a great guy, <laughs> you know, I, I, and you're a Palestinian and I, and I support. And I just found myself uh, grabbing his head very tightly, kissing his forehead, and then hugging him. I think I hugged him for like a good 30 seconds. I didn't let go. There's a picture. <laughs> they were, I hugged him for so long, there's like three photos of that. And uh, if, of course, the next day, I, I, I tweeted about it. I put it on my Facebook. I, I, um, I remember people from uh, Arab media quoting exactly what I said from English media as well. They quoted it. It made a, a, a lot of noise. Uh, it was one of the most amazing moments that I would never forget. Um, and I have that, uh, that, that moment captured in a photo where he's talking to me, explaining and justifying why he said that. And I will cherish that and I'll keep it you know, with me till, 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 to the grave. Yeah, so you really get a sense there from Tarek how much that moment in particular meant to, to him. And, and there were moments where Maradona would, would make you feel like the only person who mattered. Jihad describes him as a person who would do anything for you. He said he would give you his closest belongings, his watch, or, or basically he always said to him, anything you need, no worries, you're with me. So he described Maradona as being very sensitive, extremely considerate, and that he did everything with all his passion, he said. Jihad said that Maradona would, would call him every year to wish him happy birthday. Even if he had <laughs> gotten the dates wrong, he was a few months out a few times. Uh, but you know, that was all, almost part of his, his allure as well. But that being said, you had to take the rough with the smooth when it came to Maradona. Diego always had to feel that he was at the center of attention, I think. I remember once he, he, he told me that he was, um, he, this is his, his story, so I don't know if it's true or not, but he told me that once the Pope called him and he told him, uh, Diego, you have to calm down because uh, you know people are calling you god and everyone's uh, calling your name and uh, you know so you have to lay low a bit so diego told me that he told him uh, look uh, go call the people you know don't call me <laughs> so uh, you know i can imagine he was he was so famous so much attention that uh, probably when when things uh, started slowing down for him, it was difficult to accept. You know? The other sad thing is that uh, maybe, I mean, I didn't, I didn't see it personally, but I always heard that a lot of people took advantage of it. A lot of the times I saw sadness in his face because I think he felt that everyone was there to, to get something from him, you know, whether it was money, whether it was just to be with him because he's famous. And so I think in a way he felt alone saying no one wants to be with Diego, but everyone wants to be with Maradona. Uh, but I guess that's the price you pay when you, you're just, you know, so famous. But Jihad prefers to look back on the good times, the chance to develop a relationship with a true icon, which actually extended also to the football pitch where Jihad would organise weekly five-a-side matches with Maradona in Dubai. In Jihad's mind, he got to know not only Maradona, but Diego, the real Diego, as he put it. And everyone who knew the real Diego considered themselves extremely fortunate. I feel very blessed to, to have known Diego. Um, lucky, very lucky. Not because I, I, you know, I spent time with a legend, not because uh, I, I never look at these things, you know. Uh, but because at least I got to know uh, the person. You know, I really, I can say I got to know Diego Armando Maradona. And that's what I appreciate the most. And uh, for sure, you know, the, today I, I wish I wish I spent more time with him, you know, because uh, obviously now he passed away, and 
uh, we will never, none of, none of us, me and my friends that, that played together with him, who, you know, we won't, we all realize now how, how blessed we were, definitely. And it will never, never happen again. It, it won't be the same. Even if I play tomorrow, if I play with Messi and we become best friends, it will not be the same as, as Maradona, never. <laughs> it's the intangible, you know, something you cannot describe. Uh, but Maradona had a different aura, a different energy, a different uh, charisma about him. Uh, it's something you can you can try and describe, but then you you can't at the same time. You know, uh, only those who met him, I think they they would understand that uh, he he was on a different level. Definitely, I will never meet someone like him. But thank God I have a lot of good memories, so those stay forever, I guess. I think we've been lucky through this whole series to, to be able to share in, in a lot of people's memories of, of what was a unique time in, in Maradona's life and obviously a unique time in UAE sport. Yeah, I think definitely. Look, if, if we reference it right back at the very beginning of the series, that this is a moment that in UAE's football and perhaps even UA sport that I don't think will ever come around again. As people told us every single time we sat down and, and they began to open up about their relationship with Maradona, he was very much a one-off. He was everything and more that, that everyone expected him to be, the good and the bad, which we have to, to point out as well. It was just fantastic to get an insight into to what it was like to spend any time around Maradona during what ended up being seven years in, in the UAE. You know, listening to those stories firsthand, people getting quite emotional different times as well, which, you know, we didn't expect, I don't think, set night, but, but you know, very much became the norm whenever whenever people were, were reminiscing about Maradona. So absolutely brilliant experience. I hope that everybody else enjoyed the series as much as we enjoyed putting it together and, and catching up with some of those closest to Maradona during his time here. So that brings to an end our series of podcasts looking at Maradona's time in the UAE. But to follow more stories from The National, subscribe to Recorded on your favourite podcasting app.